to Inspiring Affinity. Welcome to Inspiring Affinity. Welcome to Inspiring Affinity. Somehow the word got out that uh, Chester was always poverty stricken. He didn't have any money, he couldn't pay his bill. There's a lot of baloney. He was very heavily subsidized by people that I knew personally, like John Hayes Hammond Jr. and uh, very distinguished wealthy people. They, they sub subsidized him till the day he died. Anything he really wanted, unless it was some grandiose, you know, multi-million dollar project, he oh, had. Was this, a, was this a, a blind then? Was he doing this deliberately? Uh, so Cheney in her book talks about the legal I mean, life. When you talk about the 1890s, 1900, 1910, he was oh, so, yeah. damn, oh. so damn busy with his research, he just forgot to pay bill. <laughs> it wasn't that he didn't have money, he'd rather spend it on this magnifying <laughs> transmitter a million bucks and pay hotel bill. And so he was like an absent-minded professor, no question about it. But he's not, never poverty-stricken. Uh, he had millions to play with all his life, as you know. But, in, but during the la latter years, well, I suppose you know the basic story is when he starts building that big tower out at Warden Cliff on Long Island, uh, uh, J. Pierpont Morgan's advisors were told, you know, don't back this guy, he's crazy. We'll never be able to collect electric bills if he's broadcasting free power. This guy's got to go. Literally, from that moment when Morgan cut off the money supply, which he did, and the project stopped, which is a historical fact, and things later blown up by the U.S. Navy during World War II. Uh, every effort was made to discredit Tesla. It was an, I understand the process. I've been put through it myself. You know, whispers go around, don't talk to the guy, he's nuts, and the inventions don't work, and, and every, there were only seven engineering schools in the United States at the time. The word got out that every engineering school, forget this guy's patent, don't talk about him, don't teach his stuff. Yeah. Absolutely true. Yeah. And so there was a conspiracy by the, you know, money people uh, uh, to kind of get this guy neutralized so nobody would listen. But he wasn't neutralized. And I can tell you a story that, you know, I spent my whole life studying Tesla. I met many people who knew him personally and tried to retract every... I had a friend who's dead now, his name is John Hayes Hammond Jr., who was the son of the John Hayes Hammond, one of the original financiers. And uh, for example, during World War II, uh, I'm sorry, World War I, Tesla had all these weapons. He had remote control of submarines and rockets and missiles, you know, endless array of gear. And yet there's, there was this thing out, don't support Tesla. Well, it, uh, this is absolute truth. Jack's father had a neighbor whose name was Colonel William House, living next door to him in Gloucester, Mass. And Colonel House was the right-hand confidant of President Wilson. So House, knowing uh, Jack Hammond, the, my friend, the young one, was a student of Tesla's. The father was the philanthropic backer. House got all these stories, and he went to Wilson. He said, look, we're getting way behind in armaments. We've got to back these Tesla's ideas. So Wilson said, well, find some way to do it. Uh, we leave Tesla's name out. They went back. And a deal was made that Tesla would give all of his know-how and technology to Jack Hayes Hammond Jr. Jack Hayes Hammond Jr. got a million and a half bucks to start the research and about a million thereafter. And all through the war, he had a whole chunk of the Navy in Gloucester Harbor, and he was fitting them out with stuff that nobody in the world had, including ways of making anti-submarine you know, torpedoes work better and the earliest form of radar which didn't really resurface again until World War II. So, and Tesla just went along with it to get his ideas into practice. But that is in the archives of the Hammond Museum. Anybody can go there and gloss them in. But this is not known. You don't see this in any book. And there are a lot of other things like that. What was, what was Bergstrasser's relationship to uh, Tesla? Bergstrasser was the guy who was the FBI guy who entered the room along with another FBI guy. And they stole the papers on behalf of the government. And Bergstrasser himself pocketed a number of interesting inventions. And Bergstrasser himself gave me copies of these things that he had snitched from the government. Now, in spite of this negative thing I'm saying about Bergstrasser, Bergstrasser, from his own studies, really believed that Tesla had the answer to 
to a lot of very important problems, including this ELF thing. And I have correspondence between Bergstrasser and the U.S. Air Force. Bergstrasser tried for five years to get the Air Force to put a little bit of money just to check some of ideas, particularly the ballistic, uh, not the ballistic missile, the um, particle beam weapons that uh, Tesla had discovered. Where, be, where has that happened to Bergstrasser in the past two years? Last I heard, he was in, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. I haven't... Uh, he moved. Of, none of his phones answered. None of, the phones are still connected, but no... He moved from California. Okay. You I know saw that. him last week. Um, I was asking to call me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm actually coming in to find out his... Who, was he involved with the, of the, uh, in the Brooklyn warehouse? Is that where the stuff went to the Brooklyn warehouse? Is that where the Brooklyn went? Yeah. No, it wound up in a warehouse on First Avenue, New York City at 61st Street. That's where we finally... Manhattan storage. Man <laughs> uh, <laughs> third floor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's where we finally found the stuff. Yeah, that was where I ended up with all our stuff from our houses on the third Did you floor. warehouse it there? At Manhattan storage, yeah. I did. Yeah. People went through everything. Yeah. And I still to this day do not know how Bird Fisher ever got my name. Except he, he got involved with the film company when I got involved before I met you. No, we, I had already. Yeah, I had, I had to because I was I couldn't have done the stuff I didn't want to sell you before. It was yeah. Small world. It gets getting smaller. Yeah, it's amazing how we've crisscrossed in very critical paths that are not common paths in, in this pursuit. Have you seen the uh, Tesla's table, the the elevated table that uh, supposedly lives in lives in California with some Tesla bus? They said that. Before he died, he gave a few banquets on this table, and he had the thing removed, and the table had yeah. no, no support. It was electromagnetic or something like that. Yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, you don't know the name of the guy in California? Uh, no, I can't remember. I was told, but I can't remember. Uh, no, no, he wrote all his notes in English, actually, but uh, I don't think anybody understood him. That's all there's to it. I mean, uh, when did they become actually aware? Of the when the Russians came on the air in 1976, then somebody hit his head and said, my God, we let that out of the country, and blah, 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 and it's in the hands of those dirty commies, you know, stupid talk came up. But uh, the stuff had, you could tell when we opened up the boxes, it had just sat there from, let's say, maybe, nine, uh, maybe 10 years. You know, nobody looked at it. So we don't know exactly if anything was missing. I tried to get microfiche files, you know, which are the only copying machines they had in those days. And uh, the microfilm was so bad you couldn't read it. But I'm trying to find out what was on the microfiche files, what was in the actual papers, and what was the difference between the two. In other words, what had been stolen. Never could establish because the book bookkeeping was that bad, you know. <coughs> There's so many mysteries about Tesla, and of course Tesla himself was such a master mystifier, you know, he, he set the stage so you can't find out what he did or what he thought. I'm sure he never put his real ideas down on paper after studying his documents for years. Patent, yeah, he would put it in. But well, maybe he just kept it in holograms with frequencies, and all you do is tap in the frequencies and you'll get the answer. In his head. <laughs> oh, listen, I'll tell you one thing about Tesla. You won't believe this, but absolutely true. When I was writing my book about Tesla, which is the one that the uh, FBI has censored, I can't get it out. One of the problems I wanted to find out was what Tesla died of. There's no record of what he died of, right? I happen to be working at NYU Medical Center, which is where the New York Cor City Coroner's Office is. And I used a lot of <coughs> influential friends at the medical center, from the dean on down to other people, to try to get a look at Tesla's medical records. First place, the medical examiner would not talk to any of us, just on the phone. Secondly, he finally sent a letter. He said, our job is to protect the secrets of the dead. Here the guy's been dead like 40 years already. Is that gross? So can you imagine a situation where you can't get a coroner's report and somebody's been dead that long. Now, what the hell are they trying to hide? A lot of stuff. <laughs> well, Not one thing I know is uh, there's some evidence that I have that Tesla just didn't die naturally. The mm -hmm. FBI guy smothered him to death. And there's that a book out about that. Huh? There's a book out about that, that he yeah. was murdered. Yeah. Yeah.
Anyway, well, yeah, I talked about vital information. Now, there was another part of the test of mystery, which you may have never thought about. But my friend Jack Hammond, who was the student of Tesla for about four years, the only student he ever had, tells me that one day he was with Tesla in the lab, and this young guy of 21 years old looked at Tesla and he said, how come you don't, uh, you know, you don't have any sex life? You go out with pretty women, but you don't do anything. And Tesla just looked at him, absolute true story, and dropped his pants and showed him that he had no balls. He'd been castrated. So what I want to do is to find a confirmation of that simple medical fact, which would be in the coroner's report. And that would explain about 10,000 eccentricities of <coughs> Tesla, all the way from the earrings, the pearl earrings that would flip them out, oh, yeah, and all kinds of other stuff. You'd have taken on some attendant characteristics. Hmm? You'd think he'd taken on like a castrato. He would have taken on a very high voice. Well, he did. He had a terrible high voice. Well, he never heard his skin. Yeah. No, he, he had every, every, ah, uh, I didn't know that. Castrato, yeah. yeah. And a lot of his kinks and quirks were like that. I don't know if you ever known a good high class unit, but they have very definite. Anyway, they're all that. It bothers the hell out of me that you can't well, get sir, information like that. Is there any idea when and why that was done? You know, yeah, I have a whole theory about it, but they're. About his brother? It's a whole different story. You know, self immolation is what happened. They wanted to be pure and escaping the Austro Hungarian army and a uh, whole big story there, which is all. Recoverable in Yugoslavia, which I did. About what, about age 15, 16, 15, like that? He was about 17. He was up for the draft and you know, a lot of things. Can we talk about... Tesla died January 6, 1943. He died in his bed in the New York Hotel. Immediately thereafter, uh, May, a while May came in hours later and found out he was dead. And they called the FBI and the police and blah, blah, blah. Well, the point is that uh, Tesla had given annual interviews to New York Times, New York Herald Tribune on his birthday about a new weapon this and a space shield and all kind of talking Star Wars stuff in those days, <laughs> the 20s and 30s. And he, I have some of his private correspondence. He actually offered these defense weapons to the United States, to Canada, to Great Britain. And he wanted like seven million dollars or something to build a whole goddamn thing to have a shield against any invading aircraft or rocket or whatever. And everybody thought he was nuts. He was talking to artillery people in the government, literally. They had no idea what this was all about. So when he died, though, we were in the middle of a war, right, 1943, the FBI took all of his documents. And the reason I know this is years later, I was asked by his executor, which is his nephew, who was the ambassador, Yugoslav ambassador of Washington, to try to get back the uh, papers from the government of Tesla. And we worked at it for two years, and they used me because I could talk the lingo of these idiots in the government. And we got the stuff, and it was all shipped back and put in a museum in Belgrade. But uh, the government, uh, and I, I know the guy who was in charge, I know the two FBI guys who were still alive, believe it or not, and they gave me some of the papers that they stole themselves. I said, oh, I like this paper. No. So that was saved. Uh, somebody, Tesla discovered ways of making objects disappear. This we know. Uh, I know a guy who was uh, from DuPont who was in charge of Navy battery <coughs> construction and testing. And what they found out, they'd have batteries as big as this thing to run it for submarines, that's what they did. And they had certain requirements that they had to, when they threw the switch and shorted out the two poles of the battery, the, all the plates and the electrodes and everything had to withstand the surge of 100,000 amperes. That's an awful lot of juice, right? So they would short this thing, and you know, it was all set up in a way that nobody could get hurt, and they found out if there was a wrench left in a room or some piece of metal, it would suddenly vanish. Now, this is ordinary workers, DC batteries, and so on. Now, Tesla did the same, and they found out that metal was levitate and a lot of other things, but the main thing was vanishing. Yeah, the man is alive and he's a very reliable witness, top two official. So anyway, uh, 
There's another thing that Tesla did that nobody ever understood. <coughs> he took three Tesla coils and placed them upright in a triangle. And when you surge the juice through them, it wasn't DC, now it was AC, that objects would float and uh, things like a wrench would get white hot, but you could pick it. It had no temperature, it was just white hot. I mean, it looked white hot, but it was white, but it wasn't hot. Mm -hmm. He threw it out energy. Anyway, this has been duplicated in Canada. A friend of mine that I'm going to see I want to see how they're doing with the experiment. So that is part of the mechanism. I haven't explained, you know, why an atom can exist here, a cluster of atoms, and then somehow flip into another space. We call it orthorotation, and they disappear, and they go somewhere else. And they tend to come back to the point of origin. It's like, you know, they flip, they go out, and they come back. <laughs> a lot of vistas in medicine which don't exist. In the book, you said that you actually operated on one with the Regal. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, he taught me to operate, right. I was able to... You mean you can do it too? I never tried. I'm chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, he taught me how to stick a knife in the eye and take out a cataract, and the patient didn't feel any pain, and I had a little problem, you know, a little queasy. No, I never followed up, but it's not my intent. I just wanted to see once if I could do it, you know. I mean, that gave me the assurance and the idea that it's something that can be learned, even though we don't know what the learning process is. Anyway, isn't that enough of wonders and one-shots and tales? <laughs>